Welcome back to Misunderstood. I am Rachel Yucatel, your host. So you guys, I'm so excited to bring this episode to you. I've been waiting for a while. Um, I found this guy on Instagram. He, I mean, obviously I'm not the only one because he's been on Ellen, but his name is Zach Scow. Um, so I think you guys from listening to the podcast know how obsessed I am with my dogs. If you don't know, I have three dogs um, and they really are treated like, you know, they are my children in this home. Um, so <laughs> this guy, Zach, is a dog lover. His whole mission in life right now is to save dogs from shelters and especially the ones that are on the euthanasia list and find them happy homes. So he talks all about fostering. He, you know, helps in his community with, you know, making these dogs that really need a second chance and are mostly dogs that are hard to adopt because they are, most of them tend to be pit bulls. And those are really the most misunderstood breed in, in my opinion. I have two. You've seen now the famous Miss Peaches has gotten a lot of uh, love and, um, you know, people are starting to understand that pit bulls are not this mean, angry killer breed, which I'm very happy about. And it's so important. So Zach has started, um, his new initiative, which is called, it's not new, but it's called positive change. Um, and basically, and he also owns something called Marley's Mutt's dog rescue, but, um, he's pioneered this thing where he, he pairs these rescue dogs, and the dogs, like I was talking about on the euthanasia list with incarcerated individuals. Uh, and this is so unbelievable because they have a program, um, which is a couple months long. The dogs go get to go live in the um, jails with these gentlemen or women. And they are, they go through a real rigorous program where they get, they get a diploma at the end and they learn these skills. Um, so when they do eventually get out of jail, they have a job to go to. You're going to be floored with the, um, the statistics about people that have skills like this when they get out, um, because if they have no skills and they have no purpose, they, these people tend to go back into jail. So I love what this guy's doing. I love that he's helping these dogs that have been, you know, essentially given up on, um, and they have a second shot at life and these dogs, um, tend to all get adopted now that they have new, you know, that they've had these newfound trained skills. So, you guys are going to love this episode. I love him. I think he's unbelievable. I think what he's doing is unbelievable. And the best part of the story is he himself is similar to these dogs and these incarcerated guys and in that he's co the complete underdog. He has a crazy story about overcoming addiction. Um, he was grappling with a life-threatening illness at one point, and he didn't even think he was going to make it. And if it wasn't for his father and the companionship of his own rescue dogs, who knows what would have happened? And through, it's a story of through, you know, how unconditional love, um, it can really cha transform your life and help you understand your purpose and that you too are deserving of a second chance. So get ready for an inspiration uh, of a conversation about the possibility of redemption and healing with the help of man's best friend. I hope you guys listen and get involved if you can. So please listen to my conversation with Zach Scow. <laughs> Zach, thank you so much for joining me today on Misunderstood. How are you? I am terrific. I got my girl. Sun's out. It's a beautiful day. It's Friday. Tell, I got my tell, kids tonight. Tell our listeners about this beautiful little cute munchkin you have on your lap. Yeah, for she she exists for when I, I don't have the articulation to come up with a decent thought. I just redirect to her and people go, oh. Uh, this is my little Cora Rose, and Cora Rose is a double front leg amputee. That's why you see no legs in this general region. Um, she's rocking with her Afro puff right now. She's a little bit out of sorts. We need a spa day for her. Uh, <laughs> she usually has pink ears or blue ears or green ears, depending on what the nature of the holiday might be. Um, yeah, she's like a her. little she's a little celebrity in and of herself. My daughter um, tells me about her all the time, which is so cute. Uh, yeah, she is for sure. She um she broke her, she came to us with two fractured front legs, shattered pelvis, broken vertebrae, broken teeth. Uh, she'd obviously been in a real bad car accident. And so we uh, brought her into our home. She was my foster dog and we had to amputate those legs to save her life. And uh, she's since 
adapted very, very well. And she is kind of my sidekick. I'm up here in Fresno, California, uh, visiting a federal prison in Mendota. And I like to bring her with whenever we're touring um, facilities for dog programs or if we're visiting our own current programs. She is just like a constant source of love and light. Uh, she lives in my, I have a backpack for her, a canine sports sack that is the greatest thing in the world. And so she sits right up at my shoulder height and um, just gets to check everything out. And, and like, absolutely, it's her favorite, favorite place to be. And one of the funniest things about that is when you're walking through a prison and you have a pink poodle on your shoulder, people will be making, you know, it's a very intense place, a lot of tough eye contact, a lot of like energy you can just feel. And people will be making eye contact with her having this like emotive kind of goo goo gaga experience. And then they'll look four inches to the right and see my face and go, oh no, like, are we having an eye lock moment? So it's pretty funny to watch people like make faces at her and then have to confront my face. Wait, I have a question about her condition though. Like well, I've never heard of a dog that's missing their two, you know, that had to get both their front legs amputated. Yeah. Is that like, did the doctors know she'd be able to figure out how to walk? I mean, it's pretty amazing. No. She kind of walks like a kangaroo for people that yeah. haven't seen her or aren't familiar. I mean, that yeah, seemed she, incredible that she was able to uh, function after this. Yeah, her story is very unique. And it was very it was very important for the survival and existence of double front leg amputees. So prior to Cora, and actually a dog that I had prior to her, her name was Noel, same exact surgery, bilateral fractures of the front leg, bone infection, like potentially terminal bone infection. We tried to save the one leg and repair it with, with pins. And they're just so small. The bones are so teeny. And when they're shattered like that, it's very difficult to, to try and repair. So believe it or not, prior to her, I had another double front leg amputee named Noel. And the two of, you know, and when it started, veterinary technicians, even the veterinarian did not want to do the surgery. They said, this is cruel and unusual. We're not going to lop off the front legs of a dog. You need to just put these, this animal to sleep. Um, I got a lot of people on social media giving me a hard time saying, oh, you know, he's just doing this for Facebook likes and social media attention. And really what it's resulted, because they didn't believe it was viable. They didn't believe a dog with no front legs would be viable. And not only has she she's shown to be viable, you know, she's extremely mobile. She's extremely, I mean, the point is, you know, can she give and can she receive love? And she yeah. can do those um, in spades. And uh, it's we've gone on now to have seven or six double front leg amputees uh, who have come to our rescue organization with broken front legs that were unable to be fixed, whom we've helped guide into that that world of double front leg amputation, uh, which includes carts so that they can be mobile. I mean, she has a right. cart that she's mobile on, she has a backpack. Um, so she's extremely mobile, very free, literally the happiest creature I've ever come across in my entire life. She is just a ball of love and light and lives to transmit and convey that message of like present love and lightness. Oh, that's amazing. I'm curious how hard it was though for her to learn how to walk without the cart. I mean, the cart seems like that might be uncomfortable at first and they can figure it out, but to walk without it must have been totally changing their mindset. Yeah, it really was. The The process was, believe it or not, it wasn't the lack of front legs that became overly challenging for her. It was her broken vertebrae and pelvis. Oh, you know, right. she was so limited in her movements. So I had to put a t-shirt on her and kind of hold her okay. upright to, uh, and then the hips have to have a fundamental change. Her hips had to loosen up. So she had to really like practice being vertical, practice the the movement of like the, to gain the dexterity and she gained it pretty quickly. It probably so it's a learned, it's a new learned movement and trait that she's yeah, Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she learned how to go upstairs. She learned how to go downstairs. She can jump up on the couch now. She can, she she's extremely capable and mobile and free and and she's just dialed. She's dialed life in better than wow. better than me certainly. This episode is proudly brought to you by Lola V, an award winning hair care line founded by the one and only Jennifer Aniston. My hair is my thing, and I put it through the ringer. Whether I use curling irons or change the color all the time, it really takes a toll, which is why I love Lola V, and it is my must-have. It not only repairs the look of damage, but it also shields my hair from future harm. Lola V is all about naturally derived plant-based goodness, no silicones, sulfates, 
parabens or gluten, and it's cruelty-free and vegan. We love that. And since I'm not a gatekeeper, here's a treat for you. The limited time now, you can exclusively get 15% off your entire order at lolavie.com. Just use code UNDERSTOOD at checkout. I mean, if you're taking hair care advice, why listen to anyone besides the woman who gave us the Rachel? Thanks, Jennifer Aniston. So Lola V helped change my hair for the better, and I love sharing things I like with you guys. The restorative shampoo and conditioner are game changers. And with all the styling I put my hair through, as I said, it needs some extra love. So I also get the intensive repair treatment. So people have come to stay with me in the last couple of weeks since I've had this. They've tried um, the shampoo and conditioner that I have, and now I've ordered more for all my guest best bathrooms. Um, and I actually sent a couple friends as like little gifts after they left um, some more uh, stuff like that. And also, by the way, I want to say their hairbrush, like their wet brush is my favorite. Um, and same thing with my daughter. So unlock Jennifer Aniston approved hair at lolavie.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use code understood at checkout. That is 15% off your order at lolavie.com with promo code understood. Please note you can only use one promo code per order and discounts cannot be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them that we sent you. Your hair will thank you. So, all right. So people that are, are listening and not watching and haven't seen how cute she is, what what is her Instagram? Because I want people to know. Her you Instagram know. is the Cora Rose. So just T-H-E. C O R A R O S E. I got her on Valentine's Day. I adopted her Valentine's Day of 2017. Oh 17 or 18. Yeah, one of those, one of the two. I think it was maybe it was 18. And uh yeah, she's been with me ever since. So she's been with me for six years and she's about 10 years old. And wow. uh, yeah, she still has a little bit of a hitch in her giddy up. You know, you can still she, her pelvis was shattered. So she, you know, it's such a serious injury, and especially as we get older arthritis and joint pains and things like that start to manifest. So I'm just keeping an eye on her. I have, a, I have her on a litany of vitamins and supplements, just like myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like we all need to be on. Yeah. Um, okay. So the reason why you are here is because I found you on uh, Instagram. I, I have three dogs myself. I like animals more than I like people, quite frankly. Um, you are a a promoter and a lover of and a believer in the underdog. It's very clear without knowing you that I saw that in you and I started following you and going down a rabbit hole of all the stuff you do. And I just thought it was such an incredible story. And so that is why I wanted to talk to you personally. And that's why I wanted my listeners to hear your story. So before we get into what you're doing now and why that caught um, my attention, you know, the more I dove into why, you know, my question is always like, how did they how did this person develop this interest? Why, what was their love for animals? You know, something must have happened or maybe they liked animals as a child, whatever. And I started to understand your story more. So I do want to get into that because now sure. um, you are, uh, you know, you are interesting in who you are because of what you went through and how you got through that. And I think that is such an important thing for people to hear because so many people yeah. are going through the same thing in their own version. So let's get vulnerable. Let's do it. So um, I want to start kind of in your childhood a little bit where um, you started to realize that you were having some issues with addiction. And I'll just let you take over from there. Yeah, I mean, I think alcohol and alcohol specifically was always a huge part of my cultural upbringing where I grew up. I'm from Hermosa Beach, California. Same with drugs. From a family standpoint, alcohol was critical to all, everyone who I cared about and valued or admired, you know, mm -hmm. alcohol was a critical variable to their life. My dad, my mom, my grandparents, aunts, uncles. So I, for as long as I can remember, I, I just remember wanting to drink and like, when, when is the time when I get to, when, when, you know, when am I adult enough? And so I don't know, I probably started sneaking alcohol at 10, you know, just bottles uh, of wine, my mom's wine. Um, you know, as I got a group of friends that were interested in experimenting with those things that would just escalate. And, um, you know, I didn't get into hard drugs until probably the end of high school. So not until like 16. Uh -huh. And, uh, and then obviously cannabis, all, all the rest of those things. But um, my love, my love was definitely alcohol. Alcohol was something that I felt was necessary to be a proper adult. I thought alcohol was what you needed to be uh, brilliant, inspiring, gifted, 
uh, deep, complex, uh, all of those things, um, you know, tor when, tormented. When you, when you used, did you feel like it brought a wall down and you were able to be more comfortable? Um, you know, in dealing with so many people in my life that have gone through addiction and then obviously knowing so many people and having so many shows on the topic, you know, it, it's it's known that it's a disease, right? And a lot of people start it, though, because they're covering up a feeling or they, they want to get away from something. So do you think there was yeah, any anything like that for you? Alcohol did a, did a lot for me in the, in the early days because I... Um, I can't say that I've ever really felt comfortable in my own skin. I can't really ever say I've looked in the mirror, been thrilled at what I saw, been contented with with uh, being in my in my body. Um, existing for me uh, ha has been um, can be tormenting sometimes, and certainly back then. I also went through some childhood sexual trauma that made me very scared of women. Uh, made me very intimate. I mean, I was always drawn to women. I was always attracted to women. I was always pulled into their trance. I've always been just, I've always just loved women. But when you go through abuse as a child, um, it resulted in having a deep fight or flight sense whenever intimacy was, and even sometimes just having women present because they, they were a threat. Um, mm -hmm. They were also, again, the, the conflict was that while they were a threat, I was still drawn to them as a boy going through puberty, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it was very hard for me to rectify that. I was like a, a pretty handsome younger kid or at least mildly attractive. And, you know, I was kind of put into a variety of different dating situations that I was extremely uncomfortable in, but there was a bunch of expectations around, you know, dating like the older cheerleader and, oh, well, you know, you got to, you got to act as if, and the entire time I was terrified. I mean, I couldn't bring myself into any sort of successful intimate experience, whether that was fooling around or sex, or I was, you know, really, really terrified. I mean, a, a deep fight or flight state whenever intimacy was like, occurring or, um, or inevitable. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me a very long time to process that alcohol was really the only thing that helped me be able to take a breath, and have my heart rate go down and have that, that, uh, flight or that fight or flight state subside. And I, th I think, um, as a young man, learning how to integrate yourself into, into your society and, and learning how to experience women, it, was almost something that I needed. I don't know that I would have been able to interact with women in any state unless I had had alcohol. Um, but obviously, I became dependent on alcohol very quickly. I became dependent on drugs very quickly. I got into crack cocaine in in late high school or, and then in college, got into selling drugs, got into um, just supporting that lifestyle. And um whew, yeah, I mean, I was covering up a lot of things. I was covering up shame. I was covering up um, you know, where I thought I should be in life, what I, what I thought I should be doing. I, I was just a, kind of your typical alcoholic addict. I was, you know, an um, egomaniac suffering with a deep inferiority complex, you know? So in other words, I didn't think much of myself, but that's all that I thought about, you know, right. was that I wasn't much. And when you were younger, did your parents notice what was going on? Were you sent to rehabs ever? Like, how was it being dealt with at home? No, I was a really good student. I played sports. Um, everything started to drop off in senior year, senior year of high school. Okay. I went to San Diego state. I got kicked out of San Diego state. Um, there was never really a, a proper reckoning for my parents, both my parents. Um, I, well, my mom is a sober alcoholic, 12 years sober. My dad is a practicing alcoholic. And, um, so I, I think because of their own involvement with alcohol, it was very difficult for them to be honest about what I might be confronting. Right. Uh, sure. Yeah. So it, it was, I, I, I never went, you know, prior to getting sick, you know, prior to going into liver failure, I, I never went to a meeting, never thought, I, I, I remember, I mean, it, it was so delusional. I mean, I, I remember at all circum, like against all, no matter what happened in life, I was committed to using alcohol. I was committed to finding a way to make sure I could drink, regardless of all the terrible things that were happening to me, regardless of all the circumstances that alcohol was generating in my life. I was deeply, deeply committed to just making, figuring out a way for it to happen. For, to, to make it happen, to keep that love of my life a, a pivotal variable in my existence. It was, alcohol was my was my existence. That was the only time I felt comfortable, the only time I felt like I could breathe, the only time I felt like I could sleep, the only time I felt like I could live up to my potential when it came to social scenarios, communicating, interacting, you know, was alcohol. So you remove alcohol from me and you remove me, like you 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 fundamentally remove me. That's how I felt about it. 
And those mm-hmm. times where, uh, you know, I got in a car accident in 2003, broke my chest, you know, broke my sternum. And um, I remember about six months later after my, my chest had healed, I was getting off the, the um, pills that I was taking. I was now fully healed. And I told myself, I'm going to go one day without drinking. You know, I've been 20, I've been drinking 24 hours a day during this injury. And I'm just going to go one day and, and, you know, see if we can get through that. And I, I couldn't get close. I mean, I was at the, I was at the liquor store at six o'clock in the morning, as soon as it opened. And I committed in that moment to make sure I found, I could find a way to drink for the rest of my life. Like there was after that, that futile piss poor attempt of trying to go one day without alcohol, I just doubled, tripled down and, and recommitted to alcohol in every possible way. Um, and then of course, you know, five years later I got sick. Yeah. Wait, so I'm just curious. So you were like a functioning alcoholic, like people, you weren't stumbling down the street, clearly you got into a car accident or you had some actions where you got kicked out of school, it sounds like, but you could function through the day and be a good, I mean, normal, normal human being. Define function, define normal. I mean, I, I, uh, my life was defined by, yeah, I guess relative normalcy and then the like violent perturbations that alcohol creates in your life, you know, where it's like somewhat normal and then Jesus Christ, what happened on Friday? (laughs) <laughs> and then something normal for a while. And are you fucking kidding me? What was that? You know, like these, these obnoxious um, occurrences that alcohol and drugs kind of like introduce into your life that you try to forget. Right. Okay. I got it. All right. So yeah. let's fast forward. As you mentioned, uh, years later, when you were in your mid to late twenties, right, you uh, found out that you were quite sick. How did that come about? And tell us what happened. Yeah, I started to, um, so I was drinking 24 hours a day after that car accident. I became a 24 hour a day drinker. A lot of, a lot of folks out there who might've suffered with alcoholism will remember that commitment. The moment they became a professional, a mm. professional, which is the, I am now, I am now committed to drinking. And they were not the quitters. Evening. Yeah. 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 In the morning. I mean, I had, I had boxes of wine everywhere. At, at the end, I was drinking a box of wine a day. That's, Ooh. that's five liters. That's like eight bottles of wine. Um, Wait, could you hold down a job or a girlfriend? I know girls were an issue, but what? I mean, no, not really. I mean, yes and no. I mean, I had jobs that I held down, but it was touch and go for sure. Right. I had relationships. Go ahead. I had relationships that, that, you know, were relationships, but I wouldn't call them successful. Right. Okay. Or enabling of what you were doing. How did you afford all these drugs and, and drinks? Well, I couldn't afford drugs very well. I mean, we, I, I sold drugs to afford drugs, um, okay. but in the end, it, it was and I was I was working, so I was you know making a paycheck, and it was really just when, whenever you associating with the right people will get you into circles where drugs are available. Um, but for me, really, it was just making sure I always had alcohol and copious amounts of alcohol. That was my biggest fear was running out of alcohol. For those for those folks out there who have made this kind of life commitment to alcohol. That was my single biggest fear was running out of alcohol and being separated from alcohol because of the, the torment. It's hard for, it's hard to express and explain how difficult going into alcohol withdrawal is like mm-hmm. when you're physically addicted to alcohol and just sociologically, emotionally, completely dependent on that ability to check out and that ability to, you know, where you have very little coping skills and alcohol is essentially your coping skill. You know, it was uh, it was very, very, very difficult to imagine. I mean, it was impossible to imagine life without it. It just it was it was integral to my existence. And like I said, if you remove it, you remove me. If you take alcohol away, you might as well put a bullet in my mouth. Right. But wait, I have a question on that. Do you, did it ever occur to you like, oh, my God, this is so bad for me. This could make me sick or I can't continue life this way. So tomorrow I'll start or I'll change at yeah. some point. Did you ever go through that? Yeah, I did like a couple of times, you know, especially after those like violent perturbations of some some incident that makes you rethink your life. But yeah. for the most part, I was completely committed. And again, those people in my life who I loved and who were my role models, all of my role models were alcoholics, every one of them. And so, you know, it was more, Zach, get a hold of yourself, you know, tone it down or 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 try to adopt some some habits or some drinking patterns that can make you less of a liability. But, sure. but never, never would I consider removing it from my life ever. Right. Okay. Yeah. So explain to people what, like, what were your first symptoms and how did you finally find out that you were really sick? <laughs> yeah, it was tough. You know, I started to turn co- colors. I started to get like this gray, yellow hue. And then my eyes started to turn yellow and my belly started to fill with 
liquid. So my belly started, I started to get pregnant, like two months pregnant, three months pregnant, four months pregnant, and it just got bigger. And then I started to get stretch marks on my sides and in my stomach. And you could hear, basically what happens when you're in liver failure is your, your liver stops functioning. It stops filtering blood and bile in your system. And then it just pools in your abdominal cavity, the nearest empty space that it can go. So your Mm. abdominal cavity just fills. It's called ascites is what it's called. When you're in kidney and liver failure, you have this condition. And the only way to address it is it's called paracentesis. They stick a huge needle or they cut a hole in your back and then drain, stick a vacuum in there and and drain it out. But I started to turn colors. I started to get very, I started to bruise really easily. Anytime I got touched, I would bruise. And um, I just hit it as much as possible. I, I wore long sleeve shirts. I wore glasses so you couldn't see my eyes. Um, I started to leak blood from both ends, you know, coughing up blood and et cetera. And, you know, I went to, I finally went to a doctor's appointment because it was getting in the way and I was concerned, but I, I I don't know that I ever took it seriously. And I, the nurse called me back to go over my blood test. And this is just a blood test, like a simple checkup. I hadn't been to a doctor in probably a decade, you know? So I was just there to like, have them take my pulse, whatever, make sure I'm alive and then send me home, hopefully. And she sat down with me and she had tears in her eyes and um, she kept making like really um, bashful, but like intense eye contact with me. And I, so I knew something was wrong and she started to cry and she told me that I was in liver failure and she was petting my hand. She kept petting my hand and trying to like get me to understand what was happening. And she said, you're in liver failure, you know, and you need to go to a hospital immediately and I was like, oh, yeah, whatever. And that's not that's not the case. I just got really drunk last night. And the numbers that you're seeing are because I got shit faced last night. And let's just, you know, she goes, no, honey, that's not how it works. Like when your numbers, when your AST, ALT, your liver enzymes, your liver proteins, when they come up in this blood test, it is a sign of abuse. It is a sign of damage. It is not a sign of like inflammation from one night of getting hammered. Right. Um, and again, she never really stopped being emotional that whole meeting. She was very... Uh, she knew who I, I I had known who this person was. Um, and she basically said, look, you you could die from this. You need to go to a hospital right now. And um, I, of course, did not. That was the worst information I'd ever heard. I, I literally got tunnel vision after she said that. And I drove home thinking, there's no way they're taking alcohol from me. Like, there's no way this is going to be the death knell for alcohol in my life. Like, I can't. And so you, I immediately started to think about suicide, immediately started to think about, like, ways out. Um, and then I just lied about it. I just told my dad that, um, uh, everything was fine, that, that they recommend that I drink, uh, wine with dinner and just no hard alcohol that I was having. Like, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I made up some completely bullshit story. That was a total fabrication of reality. And I, and I just kept doing that for like another month or two. And then it got so bad. I started to get ammonia build up on my brain. And when, cause because your liver isn't processing your toxins, you get all these different chemicals end up different parts of your body and so you get ammonia on your brain which makes you not understand what day it is you lose your balance you lose your a lot of different cognitive abilities and 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 communicative abilities so at that point it was just like impossible to hide and i'm leaking blood like i'm coughing up blood i'm it was was a very ugly situation and at that point you know I, i was honest with my dad and and we went to uh they checked me into bakersfield memorial hospital for an extended stay um, that those first several days, I don't remember much of anything. I, I went through alcohol withdrawal. Obviously, my kidneys went into failure, so they were they tried desperately to to reverse that, which they were able to. And I just remember the you know the doctor came in to my hospital room, and it was my dad and I there, and he said, "Look, you know the reality is your son needs a liver transplant, and he's not going to get one." Uh, you need, you need six months of sobriety just to qualify for a liver transplant. He'll he'll be dead in ninety days. You know, his life expectancy is is less than 90 days for him to live. He is he's not even in stage four cirrhosis. He's in what we call end stage. So E N D. My my does my diagnosis was end stage liver failure, um, pancreatic issues, kidney issues, gallbladder issues. Everything tends to fail when you go into liver failure. Um, and they basically said, look, we don't do liver transplants at this hospital. You don't qualify for liver transplant. That's what you need to live, and you're and you're not going to get one. So we're going to keep you comfortable in this hospital. We're going to um, try to do what we can for you, but um, you know this is most likely the end for you. Wow. So yeah. how did you take that information? Did you believe them this time? 
I took that information with a gigantic needle full of Dilaudid and morphine. Oh. I got addicted to drugs immediately in the hospital. So they, back then they had the pain chart, you know? So the pain chart is, uh, oh, the good old pain chart. Yeah. Is a, it's a smiley face, right. a, a, a straight face, a frowny face, and then a frowny crying face. Oh, if you point at the chart. frowny crying face, they will hook you up. And they will give you as much Dilaudid as your body can handle. And they will get you addicted very quickly. And they will give it to you every three to four hours. Yeah. So that's what I did is I, I completely checked out. And, and my dad, my dad's an aeronautical engineer. He's he, as an engineer, he is a problem solver. So thank God I had him. You know, my dad mm -hmm. is the, uh, my dad is my soulmate. My dad is uh, this story of like overcoming addiction, alcoholism, liver failure is just as much, if not more of a story about like what a dad will do when he loves his child unconditionally, you know, and the lengths a father will go to, to support their child and, and be there for their child, no matter how uncomfortable it is for them. So he just set to trying to find a way to get me out of that hospital, get me to Cedars or UCLA or SF, uh, USF, any of the seven hospitals in California that did liver transplant. Um, I was getting frozen plasma transfusions just about every day to try to, you know, when you're in liver failure, your blood gets very thin. So if you get a cut, if they try to stick you with it, you'll just bleed and, mm. and you can bleed out. You know, the way that most of us die of liver failure is our, we have these veins in our esophagus that rupture and then you bleed out of your mouth. You, you, you literally die by oral bleeding that is like um, arterial. It's, it's very, very, very nasty. So they're trying to bring your, your blood, trying to thicken up your blood so that they can do proper procedures on you. So I was getting frozen blood transfusions and it would make me so, so cold. And then they would, you know, do paracentesis and drain my stomach of all this bile and blood. And I remember the nurse, like she was a um, Pakistani and culturally Pakistanis do not have any sort of empathy or sympathy towards alcoholics. And I remember her like putting that vial of this huge, there was like three liters filled with stuff that they just pulled out of my body. And her basically saying like, look at this, this is what you did to yourself. Like, look at this disgusting thing. Like, look at what you did to yourself. Um, so it was it was a nightmare of an experience. I, I spent six weeks at Bakersfield Memorial just getting sicker, just getting sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. And I mean, I looked like the sickest sick person you've ever seen. You know, I, I got down to 140 pounds. I'm 180 pounds. Got down to 140 pounds. It's completely yellow. Um, really just an awful, awful experience. I did have my first meeting, my first 12 step meeting in the hospital with some guys from central office and one of the guys had gone through liver failure from hepatitis C. So a different type of liver failure, but he'd gotten through it in prison. And so my yeah. dad, all of a sudden my dad's hearing this guy talk to me. And at first, you know, they're wearing short, they look like Mormons. They're wearing short sleeve shirts with tattoos and ties on that are put on funny. And, and he's not paying attention. And then this guy starts sharing how he got through liver failure in prison. And here I'm in a hospital. So mm -hmm. my dad starts listening. I'm like, well, does that mean there's hope? Does like right. does that mean we can? And he, uh, it really, it was a catalyst. Uh, you know, you need any hope when you're that destitute, like when you're in that poor of a situation. Um, you need anything you can glom onto. So I think that was really important for my dad. I don't really remember it. Uh, I was very intoxicated for the majority of that stay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think by that point they had given me. They have hospital babysitters. Are you aware of this? No. I, I, I'm almost proud of it because I was so bad and it's almost like a, like bad points, but I, they, when you're a danger to yourself or others and addicted to drugs, they give you like a human being that has to Velcro themselves to you for the entire time you're at the hospital. And oh, then they wow. take shifts. They have to go to the bathroom with you, shower with you, clean you, sit next to your bed, like 24 hours a day. Yeah. And, you know, so I was just abusing that person, abusing the staff for more, you know, it was a, it was a very, very, very sad situation. And then long story short, what happened to kind of get me out of that was I was I was born at Cedar sinai We were working with some nurses to try and find any option for me, any option whatsoever. And like quite literally, by the grace of God, we got a call from Cedar sinai Comprehensive Transplant Center via this nurse that they would meet with me, that Dr. Tram Tran, this incredible woman who was the head of the transplant program at Cedars, would would meet with me and consider admission to the transplant hospital. And again, I didn't qualify. I needed I needed five months more sobriety to even get into this program, right? Which right, right. I didn't have five 
minutes of sobriety. Sure. And so literally signed out against doctor's orders, pulled every tube out of me, changed my clothes, got me out of the bed, literally uh, while the doctors are saying, you can't leave here, you can't take him, you can't leave here. My dad's going, fuck you. I'm taking him. Give me whatever I need to sign. We're leaving this hospital. And we sped from Bakersfield Memorial to Cedar sinai um, We had a meeting with her physician's assistant, with her and with the transplant team. And they basically said, look, we're going to, um, this is very like touch and go. Like you're, you're very, very vulnerable right now, but we're going to admit you to the transplant program. And if we keep you in this hospital, you will die. You're addicted to drugs. Um, you're getting sicker and sicker. Your body can't filter all of these toxins. If we check you into this hospital, you're not going to leave here. So we're mm -hmm. sending you home and you need to stay near an emergency room. You're going to need it, but I'm releasing you to the care of your dad and your dogs, and you need to do your best to survive. And if you can survive six months, then we'll give you your liver transplant. So just quickly, so I understand your frame of mind. I mean, so from this story, it really sounds like it was your father's hope and will for you to live and not lose his own son that got you to this point, because it sounds like you were kind of out of it and probably couldn't even make that decision for yourself. Yeah. 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 So going uh, home, I, were I you like, awesome? Yeah. I mean, I were, was a... Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say going home, were you like, awesome, now I can do whatever I want? Or you're like, no, no, I'm... I'm going to try and make this change, if not for me, for my dad. Like, where was your head? Yeah. So um, when I went home, I couldn't sit up in the car. G's, like pulling lateral G's. Like anytime, I had so much liquid in my belly that I, doing everything was extraordinarily painful. And so what I didn't realize I was going to have to do was kick um, drugs as soon as I got home. So, um, by the way, are the kids too loud from the school next door? Or is it? No, no, no I don't hear I, it at all. Awesome. So the very rude awakening was coming home and then realizing I was completely addicted to drugs physically because I started to go into withdrawals. So the first thing I did was beg my dad to take me to the emergency room so I could get shots of dope. And I did that four or five times where right. I just basically threw a tantrum and said, look, I'm dying. I'm going to die. I'm in pain. I'm in pain. I'm in pain. Please help me. Please help me. And he took sympathy on me. And, and then finally got to the point where he's like, yo, I'm not taking you to the hospital anymore. You're going to ride this out. And so the big, that, that was the first big experience was uh, going through opiate withdrawal with my dogs. And I remember Marley sitting next to me. I remember being completely just shocked at what I was seeing. I had full visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, like blood coming off the walls. I'd never experienced a terror like that, like a full body, full emotional, full transom terror, you know, kicking that drug, you know, in, intravenous Dilaudid was just brutal. And it was like almost two days in the bed. And I, the, my dog Marley was a 90 pound Rottweiler pit bull. And I just remember the only thing, like the only thing that would help me, because I couldn't hold down water. I couldn't hold down food. I was puking up everything. I was just feeling his chest rise. I would just put my hands on his chest. And he had this like brilliant, confident, stoic, uh, assured, like all knowing, yeah. and he, and that fucking dog, like he just gave me strength. Like he was such a strong, I always tell people that, uh, men wanted to be like him and women wanted to be with him. Mm -hmm. You know, he was just one of those dogs that was so handsome and he just, the way he carried himself and he was so kind and he was so loving. Yeah. And he really helped me get through that experience. And then, um, Kind of coming out of the end of that, I had I had gone to the bathroom in bed, which is a regular occurrence at, at that time. You lose control of your bowels completely, and they have you on this medicine called enulose or lactulose, which makes you lose your bowels. And I walked into the bathroom. I was completely naked, and we have like a full-length mirror in the bathroom. And uh, I um, walked into the bathroom to clean myself up. It was the middle of the night, and um, I just remember looking at, I turned on the light and looking at the mirror, and I could not believe what I was looking at. Like, I had, my my belly was like 10 months pregnant. I was enormous. It had all these varicose veins feeding it. My belly button was herniated. I had all these purple stretch marks. Everything was bruised. I was terribly skinny. Like, my arms were like that big. My eyes were all sunken back in my head. And I did not recognize myself. And I just remember staring at myself going, oh, my God, like, 
but I had poop on me, you know, and, and I'm just going, what? You know, it was such a terrifying confrontation of like what, uh, you know, when you stop to recognize you, when you can no longer recognize yourself in the mirror, it's a very terrifying experience. Like, I didn't know where I had gone. I knew I was still kind of in there, but like I was gone, gone, you know, and um, I just started to cry real bad and started to weep and really feel sorry for myself and really just kind of um, when you're that when you're suffering that deeply, suicide is like right is always right there conversationally it's always very easy to bring up it's always very easy to turn to it right. gives you something when you're when you're powerless and hopeless it gives you something to put your mind into like mm -hmm. that's productive like okay well i can't affect anything else can't do anything else fucking right so i'm going to just focus on taking my life and if i do that at least i will have like manifested something i will have carried something out that that will like lessen suffering for other people mm -hmm. you know um yeah so in that like worst possible moment, you know, I looked down at my dogs and it, and it was like, it's comical looking back on it because they look, they're all looking up, they're all next to the toilet and they're all looking up at me, all three of them, like nothing is wrong. Like absolutely. Like it's just a normal day. Maybe even like they're making fun of me. Cause I, cause I soiled the bed and, and like, everything's just good. And I'm, and I'm gorgeous and, and, uh, and I'm, and I'm wonderful and I'm loved and I'm loving and and then they did the way they looked at me was just like I was there, you know, and I'm in the middle of this, like, I don't fucking exist existential crisis where I do not see myself. And as soon as I look at them, not only do they see me, but they they don't see anything wrong with me. You know, they see me this like ultimate recognition of my soul and of 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 who is in me, what is in me, the goodness in me, the God in me. And it really affirmed me and it really like really made me slow down for a second and go, all right, oof, you know, maybe, um, maybe we can do this. You know, we got to at least try, we got to at least try, you know, I, I got to at least try. And, um, I got them, you know, I got them with me. Um, we're an incredible unit. I got my dad, like, let's just try. Mm. And so I didn't go to bed that night and I, I journaled a bunch of stuff. And then we, we took our first walk that next morning. I couldn't walk very far. I took a picture of the sunrise too that morning and I still have. And um, that was the first day of the rest of our life. That was the first step, literally, metaphorically, literally towards changing my life. And we just walked. I, I could only go down the driveway at the time, but I, I walked like three times that day with my dogs. And then every single day after that for probably a year and a half, uh, religiously. And, and what started as a very slow walk went, you know, into a jog, went into a run and you know, I, I quickly, my body very quickly started to repair itself. I, I changed everything about my diet, everything that was going into me. Um, the only in instructions they give you when you're in liver failure is to not have salt, essentially. That's really all they tell you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I changed everything. I mean, I was going to meetings on a liver card of all things. A lot of people go to meetings on court cards. I was there to get a liver transplant. So mm -hmm. I'm having to get my things signed and, and sent down to Cedar sinai and um, I started having these vegetable smoothies every morning, which I still do. I've done it every day for 15 years. And uh, believe it or not, like true miracles started to occur in my life. You know, I started to get better rapidly. And I have a very poor attention span. So rapid is good for me, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started to be able to, and I just really threw myself into the dogs. I started volunteering for a bunch of animal welfare organizations locally that I had, I had piddled around with before, you know, before sobriety. And I just started bringing dogs into my pack. And every part of my waking minutes was dedicated to those dogs. So um, writing their bios, taking their pictures, getting to know them, making it stupid. Like, I just made them funny. They were always like um, criminals, you know. So this, this dog was in the in the shelter for peeing in public or, or like drunk and disorderly conduct or loot, you know, loot and listen, whatever. But anytime I would do these wanted posters to try to get my dogs adopted, I'd always make up this ludicrous story. And so people started to love these pictures. I, I put the flyers all over town. So like at 25 different stores, they'd have these this bank of, of dogs. And I always like I had three foster dogs, which then became five, which then became. So I had a shitload of dogs quickly all rehabilitating them in the garage, walking every morning, walking every noon, walking every afternoon, doing pictures, going to events, going around town. And quickly I became this like novelty, hilarious recovery guy in my community where I'm this yellow 
swollen dude in liver failure with a black pit bull, um, you know, who's always around town in his truck, putting flyers up and posters and doing adoption events and all this stuff. And, and long story short, um, by the time I achieved six months of sobriety, by the time I became eligible for my transplant, I no longer needed one. Wow. You know, my body had repaired itself and continues to repair itself. I have what's called stage three fibrosis. So I still have advanced liver disease, um, but my pancreas is, is functioning. My kidneys are normal. My gallbladder is relatively normal. And my liver is, um, is healing and getting better every year. So, all right. This is why it was so important for me to have you tell this story because I, as opposed to talk about what we're going to talk about now, but because you literally talked about the fact that you just, to get out of this, you had to take one step at a time, then one day at a time and yeah. then find a purpose. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and that purpose, and for some people finding a purpose is, is probably the hardest yeah. thing, but once sure. you found it, that gave you the ability to care about something more than yourself to take care of yourself. And that to me is such a good lesson. And obviously dogs. Uh oh, you know what I want to touch on also, like how important my community was. Mm -hmm. I had a sober community that was fucking pulling for me every day, all of them, you know, in the beginning, people didn't want to get close to me because they thought I was going to die. And, and yeah. I was completely disruptive. Like I went into the first meetings, I would just raise my hand and just start talking all, all the whole meeting. I would just interrupt blatantly. I would, I, I would like, I would be, badger them about needing a liver transplant. Like, look, I need a liver transplant. I need to talk to the president. They're like, we don't have a president. Like, well, all right, give me the vice president. Like, we don't have a vice president of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm like, well, let me talk. They go, we got a secretary. Like, well, let me talk to the secretary. And and I was just on this. And again, like I wasn't there and I had no context for recovery. So I didn't understand it. And they they uh they really welcomed me in and they helped me, they helped push me, they helped support me, they helped introduce me to a god of my understanding. I was a like vehement atheist coming in and, and I could, ex I could debate any theist, you know, I was very proud of that. I was very proud of my atheism, you know, at best agnosticism. I was very proud of that. And, um, to get introduced to spirituality and to walking meditations and to a power greater than myself, which really started with my sober community. That's what introduced me to the idea of, of also serving something greater than yourself, because the only time I would get respite from like what I was dealing with up here was in those meetings. Mm -hmm. Those meetings, man, I was like, I'm not, I, I I was one of those, you know, tragically unique souls where I just thought, you know, no one's fucked up like me. No one is as, as just despicable and, and desperate as me. You know, I'm, I'm special. And you should all take sympathy on me because I'm special. And that wasn't the case. And the more, you know, to get involved in actually helping other people too, not just being the one that needed to be helped. Like I started to very actively help other people, you know, friends of mine in my circle, sober friends. And, and, you know, there weren't a lot of young people in that, in that room. And so mm -hmm. in that group. And so it was really, it, you know what it gave me, it gave me so, that working with the dogs and, and working with my sober, like community self-esteem, you can't maintain sobriety. If you, if, if you don't work on your self-esteem, right. sobriety in action, you know, they taught me how to live. They taught right. me how to get out there. They taught me how to cope. They taught me how to, how to have some modicum of confidence that I could get through things. Cause when the going got tough, I would just throw up my hands and be like, I'm fucking terrible. I suck. I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, I just had this defeatist mentality and I, and I just thought so poorly of myself, you know, constantly. And I didn't know how to rebuild that that poor self-esteem, that poor self-image that like, I, I fucking hated myself. I mean, mm. deeply, deeply hated myself. And, and when you become sober and you get to do so in a group like that, they give you a roadmap. There's a roadmap to rebuild yourself. There's a roadmap to be accountable for yourself. There's a roadmap towards learning how to live with your isms and your disease that is, is glorious. Um, but you really have to check out of yourself. You have to check into something else, a, a power greater than yourself, a community greater than yourself, ideas greater than yourself. And if you don't do that, you'll always fall back on yourself, which at the end of the day, you are the problem. You know, you are the disease. And um, I, I, there's just no substitute for sober community and what it was able to do in my life and, and still does in my life, you know? Right. So I want to talk about what what you just brought up, the fact that you had a community that helped you and now you are helping 
um, a community. You have something called Positive Change. Um, it's the Inmate Canine Training. Tell people about this because this is what drew me to you. I think this is such a fascinating idea, and I want to hear how you even came up with it. Positive Change is the greatest, um, I don't hesitate when I say this, it's the greatest thing in the history of programs. It is. <laughs> So to me, it's just the greatest thing ever. I light up whenever I get to talk about it. I light up that I get to do it. Um, Positive Change is a comprehensive inmate canine training program that we run in a bunch of different prisons and juvenile facilities. And essentially what that is, right? So in California, we still euthanize in our communities, Kern, Los Angeles, Kings County, Tulare County, about 40% of young, large dogs. So we are still euthanizing a tremendous amount of animals. We house these animals, we feed these animals, we pay for people to take care of them, and then we pay for two people to hold that animal down, inject it with sedative and euthanol to kill it, thus creating this manifestation of absolutely fucking terrible negative energy that just propagates throughout the world. And it's and it's just terrible. It's just a, a societal black eye that we ought to all be ashamed of. The, the way we treat man's best friend, it, we treat them like man's worst enemy, and it's abominable. It is just fucking terrible. I'm sorry for cursing, but if it's no, if it's if it's used as an adjective, descriptive adjective, I think it should be allowed. <laughs> um, so we we wanted to come up, you know, back then Marley's Mutts was a foster based organization, and we wanted to come up with a way to save more young large dogs and give them the skills they needed for adoption. And the and it's very difficult to teach a brand new 50 pound pit bull who's 11 months old how to sit, stay, lay down, walk on a leash, be patient, interact with others. Those are all tremendous challenges. And if they don't dial in those variables of their existence, they're not going to get adopted. And they're going to be killed. It is mm -hmm. life or death. So we developed a, a program using dog psychology. Leah Marquez, Lisa Porter, myself, a bunch of other tremendous trainers um, created Positive Change, which is we are working, we created Positive Change to bring it into the prison system, have our dogs come off the euthanasia list into prison to live and train with our student trainers for three months. So it's a 14 week long program. We do two weeks of introduction. And then for three full months, those dogs are living, training, loving their incarcerated student trainers. There's three trainers per dog. Um, that way they can go to work, go to school, live their lives. And we always pair up outside of um, gang and racial affiliation um, California prisons are radically racially segregated. It is like Jim Crow South on steroids. It, has, it, it is rigidly, rigidly segregated. So whites, blacks, northerners, southerners, others, everybody has this racial construct to their existence in there, preventing you from interacting with people, eating with people, trading with people, working out with people. Like It's all very rigidly structured. And and what's really cool is that positive change disrupts that racial disharmony and, in, in, and um, includes and encourages uh, racial and gang balance where people are actually communicating. Um, go ahead. Wait. So I'm curious about that. Does that ever cause any conflict with other people not in the program that don't understand and are like, why are you hanging out with these? People? Um, we have had all kinds of conflicts over the, you know, we've been doing it for eight years okay. and we've had various gang factions not want to participate because they thought we were extensions of, sorry, I want a second. Okay. Because they thought we were extensions of the correctional staff um, we've had, there was skepticism at first because it was so novel. It was so novel that the gangs thought we were part of the correctional system. The correctional system thought we were part of the gangs, you know, so there was a lot of, um, preconceived notions that were incorrect. Yeah. So long story short, we started at California city correctional facility. We had 10 dogs living in there training with, wait, wait, students. but before you even get into that, that must've been yeah. terribly hard to get the prison to even allow this to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we had to give presentations to the entire watch. So there's three watches at a prison, you know, eight-hour shifts, three shifts, right? So we'd have to sit and present in front of the entire prison staff to basically answer all of their questions, no matter how ludicrous, right. about, you know, our, they, they thought we were, they thought the student inmates were going to train the dogs to attack them, and yeah. that we, it was just a foregone conclusion that there was going to be a riot that was dog-related, dog which, of course, has never happened. Right. Okay. Uh, but but those are all valid concerns. I mean, prison's a very gnarly place. It is a very gnarly place. So um, I don't I don't blame them for being skeptical or hesitant at first. Um, or even the and, safety of the dogs, or you know, I don't know, someone that doesn't like the person that has the dog. Maybe they would try to injure the dog. Or how does what if the dog has to go out in the middle of the night? Yeah. I don't know. All those little logistics. 
Yeah, yeah. The dogs um, can go out. The dogs are crated. They live in the in the pod, so they live in the housing unit with our students. Um, they are only away from their students from 10 o'clock to 6 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. So that's okay. lights out. So lights out is from 10 to 5.30. The doors pop at 6, and the dogs are let out to evacuate. So we have to crate train them. And crate training is part of the first two weeks. There's a lot of different modalities that we're using to train a bunch of different testing points that are critically important. You know, So these dogs are getting crate trained. And, well, really, the, the, <laughs> the structure that moves the program forward is the Canine Good Citizen Certification, which is a 10-point test that if you graduate, if you pass that very challenging 10-point test, your dog is a certified therapy dog by the end of it. So oh, it's, wow. it's, um, they, they only need to put in their 40 hours of community service. So we have a, a therapy program called Miracle Mutts. So a lot of our, for, a lot of our more Miracle Mutts are former positive change graduates. Um, okay. and, and so the, the real magic uh, of the program, I'll try to, to explain most of the variables and why I find it so like enthralling and brilliant and wonderful. Um, Recidivism in, in the United States of America is 75%. That means after five years free, 75% of formerly incarcerated end up back in prison. That's at a cost of about $85,000 per inmate per year. The taxpayers are paying almost hundred grand just, just to lock somebody up, not even court, not including court costs. Mm -hmm. um, our recidivism rate is zero. So we have had no one go back to prison. And our success rate, conversely, on the outside is we have almost 30 formerly incarcerated dog trainers. These are men who went through our program. Some of them spent many years in our program, graduated, got out of prison. Most of them long-term incarcerated former gang members and, and most of them loss of life crimes. So these are people who are societally given up on mm -hmm. and we've been able to leverage their potential, have them expose and enrich their potential. And almost 30 of them are professional dog trainers. If you ask any number of different uh, rescues, LaBelle Foundation, Road Dogs, any Sandy Dog Rescue, all these different rescues in Los Angeles, guess who they work with? They work with our trainers who learn how to become dog trainers in prison, from the Jamal Hendersons to the Nyet Bo, all of our different Oscar Robinson, Isaac De La Rosa, all of these guys are serving the rescue community. They are constantly boarding and training very challenging, reactive dogs uh, now that they're out of prison. And uh, so we have a, a real solid way to save American public money on recidivism because our guys aren't going back to prison. Right. Uh, so for every year, one of our guys is out of prison and stays out of prison. We save the taxpayer hundred thousand dollars, and they're they're leveraging their potential. You know, the worst thing in life is wasted potential, right? And these guys are getting to achieve their potential. Not only achieve their potential, but plug into something altruistic, a a real black eye issue within American society, which is euthanasia. They are actively combating really terrible forces and participating in the uplift of their community. And they're able to afford to provide for their kids, for their family, for the rest of it. And, and this is a really critical idea because as formerly incarcerated, we've been looking for an economy that will help support them on the outside. We've been promised all the, the potential of these a variety of different economies like oil and gas or renewables, and none of it's come to fruition. None of these markets have really, truly accepted with full hearts the formerly incarcerated, but the pet industry does. Pet industry was built on second chances. It's a hundred billion dollar industry. There's kennel technicians, dog trainers, pet walkers, all of this is this vast array of employment that you can do what? On your phone. So you can market yourself. You can be that entrepreneur on your phone. So all of our guys, you know, who, who want to get into this field, they get on their phone as soon as they get out of prison. They set up their pages. We usually try to connect them with a job at a boarding daycare facility or to shadow under a trainer. Or a lot of them come work with us, too. We have several of our trainers who now teach in prison. So they go right. back into prison to teach. So um, wow, it's just a really, it's like across the board, altruistic, productive program that really helps turn. Because emotionally, when you are caring for something that can't care for itself, when you are providing hope and opportunity and a new trajectory for a soul, when you who have been viewed as this as as tantamount to to the devil for for all of your existence, and you get to pivot from that and put yourself into something positive, that's what it's all about. You know, we as American society have this tendency to like need faction need to look down on factions of our population. And we've always maligned the incarcerated us. Oh, these are the fucking terrible people that are just fundamentally terrible and we ought to like write them off and keep them away from us and dress them up in blue and lock them in inorganic concrete barred facilities and and really just give up on them. Mm. You know, and, and there couldn't be any more of a terrible idea than that. 
And in, instead, you know, in many cases, these are children. These are these are people who committed crimes as children who were, um, you know, had really challenging circumstances around their upbringing. And we ought to have some empathy for that. And we ought to have we ought to want to breathe new life into these individuals instead of just cast them aside and give up on them. And it just feels tremendous to get to believe in these guys and to watch them succeed and to watch them leverage their potential and to do it in a way that just blows people's minds. You know, our our society, Hearn County, which is a Republican county, Los Angeles County, people have taken notice. They love our positive change dog trainers. And they love to be part of that part of that story, that polar, that full circle moment where these guys are redemptive. It is Christ-like for crying out loud. I'm amazed I have to tr- work this hard to try to convince people that this is worthy work. Like, take a, a take five minutes to read about Jesus. What do you learn in the first few seconds? That that Jesus's people were the incarcerated, were the you know were the the flotsam and jetsam of society. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and so. You know, taking a minute to shelve my uh, my preconceived notions or societal preconceived notions about these individuals and to breathe life into them and to breathe belief into them and self-esteem, give them an outlet for discovering who they are and for being emotional because we work dog psychology. So dog psychology is very similar to human psychology, and they're really building upon the idea that all of their energy, everything that they're feeling, they are transmitting down that leash into that dog. So if they're not right, if they're not taking a minute to breathe, if they're not, then they're going to corrupt that dog. And so there's there's just so much involved in the program that helps people discover who they are, regulate who they are, understand who they are, and and kind of like, you know, find a whole new set of opportunities in life. And it's, uh, I just love it. I think it's the best thing I've ever heard. Wait, just a couple <laughs> like logistical questions that I think people are are probably thinking about right now. Mm-hmm. How do you pick how do you pick the dogs that are going to go through this program and how often are you picking a new batch of dogs? And then where do those dogs go after the training happens? Yeah. So we have a bunch of programs. So we have a boys juvenile program in Malibu. So there's three dogs living there. We have a women's program at the Bureau of Prisons, the federal prison in Victorville which had eight dogs living there. We have eight dogs at Tehachapi State Prison, and then we're going to have another probably 12 at North Kern State Prison. So we have programs running all over the state um, con- you know, at the same time. And uh, the way we choose the dogs is the city shelter or the county shelter will reach out to us. We get a euthanasia list. We understand who's going to be put to sleep. Uh, the only evaluative point that we have to really look at is reactivity. The dog is fiercely reactive, and I mean legitimately reactive. I don't mean excited. I don't mean uh, traumatized. I mean, like, legitimately reactive. We can't have them in the program because we can't have them biting people or biting correctional staff. Um, so those are the. that's how we select the dogs. You know, we are trying to help the most vulnerable. So the dogs that need it the most that are in danger of being put to sleep. Our students are also vetted, and so they have to write a essay on why they want to participate in positive change. They have to have had no uh, 115s, no write-ups, you know, no no prison write-ups, meaning infractions, for mm-hmm. at least a year. Um, and they have to be interviewed by us. So we sit them down and we have a little interview on, on why they'd like to be involved in positive change. And then they have to commit. They have to commit to be involved for 14 weeks on a daily basis. Those dogs are with them for 14 and a half hours a day. So they got to be down with that. And um, they also can't be have had a history of animal abuse or female abuse. Wow. Okay. Um, has anyone ever had to drop out of the program? Oh yeah. Plenty. We've had people, uh, get in fights. We've had situations related to drugs. We've had suicide. We've had drug overdose. We've so had, they lose, they lose their privilege of doing. That yes. Privilege. We have had people get in fights. We have had people be involved in drugs. We've had a, one round. We lost 14 students and we lost half of our class in one round, oh, uh, wow. which was devastating. Uh, that was a new program getting started um, with a class of which, with a very, very live yard. So that yard has a level three facility uh, with a lot of drugs on it. And um, that has since been rectified to a large degree. The program's much more established. The, uh, the Our teammates won't stand for it anymore. So the, the team is very strong and they're kind of able to regulate their own environment to a, to a certain degree, um, which helps helps keep the program fresh and uh and focused on the right priorities you know sobriety is a big part of what we do uh, because you can't really be effective and you can't really understand the energy you're transmitting if it's if it's uh 
corrupted energy, right? If you're on fentanyl or methamphetamine or whatever, or pruno, you know, prison wine, your energy is going to be different. It's not going to be true. The dogs are going to see through it. And so if you aim to be successful and you aim to really harness and nurture that bond to the, to the greatest of your potential, you can't be fucked up. Has, no. Have there been any um, accidents? Like, has, has a dog ever gotten hurt? Has a person ever gotten hurt? Um, you know, I know there's a difference between reactivity and the dogs and aggression, but ha- has anything happened that backfired? Yeah, we've had plenty of people get bit. Yeah, we've had correctional officers get bit. We've had students get bit. But uh, nothing terrible. I mean, a lot of these things, like, you got to understand also the energy of prison is a very tense place. It's a very palpable, thick, it's almost like a fog. When you walk mm. in there, it it will com- you're confronted with the energy. It is a it is a energetically terrifying place. Terrifying, like the threat of violence is is just everywhere. And so that you know sometimes the what the student inmates are feeling in terms of the correctional officers, like the the hesitation, the the you know the dogs feel that. So so we have to do a really good job to make sure correctional officers are integrated and involved in the program, so the dogs don't become afraid of them. <laughs> we have to do a good job introducing non-programmers so people who are not in the program to the dogs so that yeah. the dogs don't view them as a threat um because you know it, it is a unique environment to be dog training like that in prison be, just because of the energy because of the threat of violence because of the all the different factions and the and the turmoil and the tumult you know? so you mentioned this earlier when the program is done then you take out the animals and you help get them adopted because now uh, or to be working dogs because now they have some training. Is that correct? Do, do yeah, all the dogs of them are, get placed? The, yeah, the point of, of the program is to get them adopted. So if, if their adopters want to take them into therapy afterwards, they are certified to do so. But the main goal is just adoption. So a lot of our students will adopt, their families will adopt dogs. A lot of correctional officers will adopt uh-huh. dogs. Um, you know, the general public, you know, we post about it on the Positive Change Program page. We post about it on the Marley's Mutts page. So we're trying to... Um, yeah, we're just trying to get as many dogs adopted as possible, and then we usually wait a few weeks, and then we bring in a new crop of dogs. Okay, so that was what I was going to ask. So then you bring a new crop or some that haven't gotten adopted, do they come back into another program? Sometimes the dogs that haven't been adopted will stay inside for what's called fostering hope. So that way, you know, you can imagine it's very challenging for a student to fall in love and coexist with a dog and then have them leave. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the next question issue. I had. That's got to be terrible. Yeah, it's the worst. It's the one thing that is traumatizing, and I wish there were a way around it. We have mental health uh, professionals that a lot of them attach to our program, and a couple in particular, Dr. Hayami and Dr. Nichols at North Kern State Prison, really, really changed the the structure of the program by providing that therapy, by by providing the guys a way to understand and to cope with the loss of their dogs. Because mm. it really is just... Prison is such a terrible place, and and when you open yourself up and you you kind of release your you're trying to release your attachment issues, and then only to have that kind of deep bond ripped away from you, that unconditional love that in some cases that variable that you've always been looking for is gone, you yeah. know, and you're rotting in prison. You know, it's just it's devastating. So any and all, we also have uh, Parashat Sarah, a friend of ours, a volunteer who's also a clinician. She's involved with our our guys on the outside now, making sure that they're taken care of, that they have any questions, that they have any concerns, that they have any needs. We have a really good unit. You know, what I'm really trying to do is build an organization similar to the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, where we're like, we're like that house on the block built for our guys, so that when they get out of prison, they know we're there, they know the camaraderie, the fellowship is here, they know we got their back. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say to like make up for or step in for gang culture, but but it's really important to feel a part of something. And um yeah. So we have reunions about every three months. We get everyone together. We have dinner. We have breakfast. Uh, just try to keep the and we have a, a thread going, you know, where we where we love on each other and talk shit. <laughs> uh, you know, so we're we're really trying to not only have this be a productive part of incarceration, but also a productive part of post incarceration and integration and job placement and job development, workforce development, things like that. Uh, yeah, I I'm surprised that. This isn't like, you know, something that happens in every, um, you know, place that there, I mean, not just in California, you know, and yeah. I'm curious, is there a way that people can get involved to make this happen in their state? 
Yeah, I mean, really, it quite literally is a monetary issue. We we built a program um, format recently to help us do this without our ranch. So in other words, what that means is a remote construct of our program. In other words, right now we have our 20-acre ranch in Tehachapi right next to the prison. And that's like our logistics hub, right? So that's what serves our prisons, where dogs will leave and come back from there. Um, we applied for a program in Arizona, which utilizes local boarding uh, facility to fill that logistical need. And then we're cultivating trainers in the area. Um, so with that format, with that cooperative format, certainly if we had a, ba- a home base in any yeah. community, we could pull this off with the proper support funding. It's I know it's like expensive. doing it as a franchise or something like where exactly a hundred percent. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm working on. It, it's just the money. Like for instance, I'm, I'm up in central California right now. There's 17 prisons in this immediate area. Um, and we could serve all of them if we had a logistics hub or enough money to pay for boarding up here in, in, uh, Fresno, Tulare kind of County region. Um, so the, and, you know, even though it's expensive to pay trainers to go up, cause we go every week, we're there for four hours every week, two trainers, and we're, we're training hard every, every week for 14 weeks. Right. And that costs a lot of money to have them drive to the facilities. You know, you're paying a professional trainer for, for hours, for their day rate, essentially, um, but when it comes to the societal payback, it, you know, it can't be estimated. I mean, the, the return yeah. on investment is, is a, a thousand to one. Um, so I'm really hoping people, and I really appreciate, first of all, your intrigue and like how engaged you are and the cadence of your questions. You're very good at what you do. It's very nice talking to you. And you always seem very interested and like genuinely so, which I, I really appreciate. Sometimes you can get into the minutia with people and you see them check out and you go, Oh shit, I lost them. I better say something uh, interesting. No, because uh, I wish, you know, listen, my goal would be, I would get on the next plane just so I could go in these prisons with you. I think it's the coolest thing. And to watch on your feed, it almost makes me cry. Like to watch how attached these guys who basically have been given up on uh, and they've given oh, yeah. up on themselves, right. Yeah. Are hugging. I'm sure they don't touch anybody in there, you know, like hugging and kissing these dogs that are now theirs, you know, and yeah. to think of how they have to give that up after a couple months must just be terrible. Do they get to reapply to do the program again as much as they want? Yeah. Yeah. We've had guys that have been in for years and years and years. Um, and it probably it, gives them a motivation for wanting to get out. I, I'm sure some of them are like, fuck it. I can, I'll just be here forever. Cause it's safer. I mean, I've interviewed a couple of guys who have been um, incarcerated for over 20 years and it's almost worse for them when they get out and they were wrongfully accused. They get, sure. you know, they're able to come out and then they're like, but now what? I, this is terrible. Yeah. I don't know how to make money. I don't yeah. know what to do. Well, um, when you're in a maximum security prison, the uh, it is easier to fall into gang culture and soldiering in prison than it is to program. Yeah. So it is, it is in some cases easier and safer to be involved in the in the dark aspects of prison culture than it is to to uplift yourself. Mm-hmm. So we have to make it really attractive and real possible for them to get in. Uh, oftentimes, the positive change program is a gateway to programming overall and legitimately changing your whole output and trajectory in prison. And that's the most important thing to do. If guys want to get out of prison, if guys want to appeal to the parole board, they have to be programming. And the parole board is very complimentary of positive change. They've always been super supportive because they understand how transformative it is. Um, And, you know, the other thing is like the atmosphere of positive change, what I'm trying to bring in there is all love and light. Like what Cora does for me, I'm trying to do for them. I am hugging and dapping up every fucking person I can. I'm making eye contact. When I first started working in prisons, I was like, oh man, do I make eye contact? If I do, what do I do? Do I acknowledge them? Do I look down? Do I wave? Like, what do I do? God, it's so intense. I mean, everybody in there is so gnarly. And I just made a commitment to to just bring as much love and as much respect as possible. If you go in there with respect and love, you're going to be extremely well-received and they're going to love you for it. And not only are they going to love you for it, but they're going to start to emulate the the love that you put out. They're going to, they're going to give right back. And they're going to start to give that to their brothers. And then all of a sudden, you've kind of changed the entire vibe of a prison pod just vir- by virtue of, 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 of being loving and being kind and being respectful. And, um, you know, these guys are so fundamentally, like, downtrodden. I'm not trying to make people feel sorry for them necessarily. I'm just trying to get you to understand what it's like to be a child and be locked up for 20 to 30 years in a place that's, that is immensely, incomparably dark and an energy that you can't escape. 
you know, you, 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 it, it takes the, it sucks the humanity out of you. And, and what we get to do is, is put that humanity back into, into gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and, and really watch them, um, embrace life again. It's, it's very special. I love getting to go. I mean, even yesterday, I didn't even know any of these guys. I'm up here at, at FCI Mendota, the federal correctional institution in Mendota, passing Cora around from guys. And you see guys holding Cora going like they're bewildered. They're just, mm. they can't believe they're holding a dog in prison. And there's just a little bit of home. Dogs are metaphors for home. And these guys have not been home in so long. And just to shake hands with me and dap me up, make eye contact, have me be like, yo, I'm free. I'm here for you, dude. People are like, what? You know, they, they, they just had forgotten what it's like to be believed in really, you know, and I, I love to get to give that to them. Oh, I love it. Okay. Well, my, I, you know, my hope for you is that, and I know it takes a long time is that this could happen in every state, every city. Um, it's so important, um, not only for the prisoners, but for the dogs, as we all know, for, if you're someone who likes dogs, um, you know, every single shelter around me and rescue it's full, they're turning away dogs and the level of just, you know, people leaving dogs on the street and animal abuse and all these terrible things. Um, there are more people who are willing to help, but don't know how. So I think this is, um, you know, this program and so many other things. And, you know, it's interesting because I don't know if you follow Miss Peaches, you know, um, Dave Portnoy's dog, but, you know, there are so many people that are now obsessed with just following this one rescue story of a pit bull and like him or, or not, you know, I have two, you know, two pit bulls and um, I know that they are a misunderstood breed. I've had, um, you know, the people from pit bulls and parolees on my show who I love. I've had Lee Asher on my show who takes care of, you know, animals that are just abused and, and left for dead. And, um, he's made, do you know, Lee, are you familiar with who that is? Yeah, I'm familiar. I, I, you're right though, about the misconceptions, like where you see one dog, Dave Portnoy's dog getting all the tons and tons of attention. And you're almost baffled that people don't know that this greater issue of, of canine euthanasia really, really exists. Yeah. And like, you know, I've had, I think what Lee's done for himself and and not only his platform, like for himself personally, but like what he's done to draw people in, and and yeah. you know people can people can critique, uh, you know his beautiful hairy chest all they want, but I, but it's brilliant. Why, why does he wear a shirt? But I just still don't understand that. For the ladies, <laughs> because you gotta have you gotta be offering multiple variables to to like serve people, and if he were just a guy, you know he wouldn't be as impactful. You gotta make that cookie delicious. But and, maybe, uh, see, you're just as hot, though. So maybe you got to start taking off your shirt while you have go. these conversations. Inter maybe not in two, maybe not in prison, but, you know. Interview number two, topless. I, You know, I've been working out. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. That's right. I did laugh but, with know, Lee. I'm like, but, Lee, you're going to wear like, a shirt for this? <laughs> to, to give, like, what's, you know, I had I had multiple women. I don't know if he shared something that we did or, or what it was. But I had multiple women message me in the same week saying, you know, I see that you have these issues with dogs. Why don't you just connect with Lee and he'll help you? And I'm like, ma'am, you know, he's one guy doing an incredible job yeah. to leverage his his platform and everything else for good. But we have we have tens of thousands of dogs being in this state. Not yeah. it's not something Lee Asher can bring into his backyard or into his. You know, right. this is a huge fundamental problem, and people don't know that yeah. they're they're checked out as to the scope of what we're dealing with. The scope is massive. Right. You know? Right. Um, We're talking about a billion animals in America every year. A million. That's yeah. And, and it's, and people, you know, are watching on their feeds, right. About what someone like you or someone like Lee is doing, um, or even Dave Portnoy. And they don't actually realize that just by even fostering a dog, not making a long-term commitment that they can do so much good. So it's mm -hmm. really important for people listening to, you know, share not only these people's platforms and stories just so they get accustomed to it, but understand what it is that they can do in their own communities, um, to oh, help out a little bit goes a long way. I, um, um, you know, one thing I want to get to before we go, and I could talk to you all day, so we might have to do this again, but sure. um, our time's a little short. You were able to um, save a bunch of dogs and cats, I think, from Afghanistan, which also goes to show you that it's not even just in your little community. There are animals everywhere that need yeah. help, that can't speak for themselves. Just quickly take us through how, um, how you did that. And, and yeah, that if, you're was... doing, if you're thinking of another place to go save animals. Yeah, that was miraculous. Um, well, first of all, we've been we've been rescuing internationally for the whole time Marley's Mutts has been around. So it started with Soy Dog Foundation in Thailand and then Save Korean Dogs and the NAMI's organization in Korea. So then, then Romania and various other parts of Eastern Europe. 
And then, you know, we started bringing dogs back from Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, wow. Iran, you know, from there's a rescue in Iran called Vafa. Um, so we've always tried to leverage our platform for the betterment of dogs all over the world to try to bring their cause into the into the, the light. Um, when it came to Afghanistan, uh, this was a, an effort spearheaded by by Lori Califf at SBCA International. And SBCA International is a real dialed in organization internationally. And we knew that Afghanistan, we were going to lose Afghanistan. We knew that the motion, the wheels were in motion to pull out of Afghanistan and Essentially, what happened was there was two airports there, was Hamid Karzai International Airport and Bagram. And once Bagram closed, you know, th things hit the fan because all of a sudden now you, you've lost the vast majority of your logistics capability. And so we had very little time to try to get all of these animals out before America left. And so we had a concrete plan. We were going to land at Edwards Air Force Base. Our backup plan was the Mojave Air and Spaceport. We got approval all the way through the State Department. We grinded. I used all every contact that my dad has within the the, the the military complex, as it were, and and we had this plan developed. We had the aircraft, we, you know, we had the logistics dialed in. We had the cooperation on the ground with Charlotte and Kabul Small Animal Rescue. And out of nowhere, the CDC came in in all of their wisdom and said, none of those animals can come to America. You know, there was a ban on 114 from 114 countries on import of dogs. And they said, sorry, even though these are American dogs, even though they belong to um, these are these are mostly embassy staff animals. These are also yeah, I didn't realize that. Dogs. I got it. Okay. Wow. These were I mean not, these were not military working dogs, but protection services dogs. So airport dogs, you know, um, security service dogs. And these dogs were just these animals were just going to be abandoned, just flat out abandoned by our administration. We got all those approvals up, and all it took was one letter from the CDC to say, "Stand down. We do not approve this effort. It's not happening." And we were it was dust. It just vanished. So that we then, you know, pulled out of Afghanistan. What happened at Abbey Gate? There was a huge explosion at Abbey Gate. All of these things were while we were trying to work on getting these dogs out. We we were we were hearing communications on the ground from the second Marines about what was going on. It was just it was a crazy hectic time. And then all of a sudden our mission was abandoned and it was gone. And they said these animals are now the Taliban's taken over. Um, this is there's no hope. And Lori doesn't give up on anything. So SBC International said, regardless, we're going to make this happen. We're going to work with the Taliban. We're going to have Charlotte help, um, you know, be the go-between between the Taliban. And we're going to use, uh, we have some special forces people on their network that are able to operate and, can, and, and, and maneuver within that community. So we came up with a whole nother plan, which is to go back to Afghanistan and rescue 300 animals uh, out of Taliban-controlled Hamid Karzai International Airport. And that's what we were able to do. Um, we put together the plan. It came to fruition. Um, the, the wheels started to move. And then at the last minute, the entire thing blew up. And they said, sorry, the Rush our flight plan was through Russia. Oh so gosh. the Russians were mounting on the border of the Ukraine. So all of a sudden, Russia says, you guys can't land here. We were supposed to land in eastern Russia and Siberia. They said, sorry, your, your plan is off. You can't land in Russia. We're about to invade Ukraine. So at that minute, we had 36 hours to rectify our plan. We reached out to Dev Naz in Turkey. Uh, we, we got a team coalesced in England. And long story short, we changed our flight plan. We flew through Ankara, Turkey, and then through Iceland. And, um, and a, a really special group of people pulled their act together and stepped up, and, and we got all the animals home. Of course, we were not allowed to come into America. We had to land in, in Vancouver. Right. And uh, Signature FBO gave us um, basically a temporary shelter for four months on the YVR Vancouver International Airport. So we were operating out of there, reuniting dogs, cats, adopting dogs, cats, doing all that stuff for a period of months. And again, thank dog I'm out, SPC International, um, a bunch of different, you know, Raincoast Rescue, a bunch of really wonderful human beings, just small organizations with, with an in, indomitable gumption that just would not give up. And we pulled it off and it was right. amazing. Well, again, it's a story of one foot in front of the other, not giving up one day at yeah. a time and making yeah. it happen. Um, at how many days, how, how long now are you sober? 15 years. I'll be 16, October 12th. Amazing. Good for you. Yeah. And my mom uh, is 12, which is amazing too. And I have best friends who have lengthy sobriety and uh, it's, it's remarkable. I love that. Again, I could continue to talk to you all day, but I've got to let you go. Um, I am going to ask you to come back at some point so we could talk more about things, but um, let everybody know how they can 
um, hear more of your story um, and contact you if they want. But before I even have you do that, I just want to say for people that are listening, do not think just because you're not in the same state or area as Zach that you cannot help. You absolutely can help in all ways, shapes. Um, and if you want to contact Zach, you can DM him. He's going to tell you now how to get in touch with him to find out how to help even in your area. But it is so important. Animals need your help. People, you know, just like, you know, animals, the second you give them some attention and love, they do change. And it's all about the power of second chances, which you are totally. an example of. Totally. So go ahead, Zach, tell people how they can find yeah, you. So the best way you can find me is just at Zach Scow, Z-A-C-H-S-K-O-W. Uh, Cora's page here is The Cora Rose, which we went over. And you can go to the Marley's Mutts website, which is marleysmutts.org. And it's M-A-R-L-E-Y-S-M-U-T-T-S. Uh, positive change program on everything. So positive change on Facebook, positive change program on Instagram. And we are changing the world, you know, one program at a time. Uh, there's a lot that we do in our space. The, b- before I close, I just want to to really explain how how holistic approach to animal welfare is what we do. We are moving dogs out of the area with mutt movers. We are providing therapy with the Miracle Mutts. We're providing training and programming with Positive Change. Then we have our rescue ranch. So we are doing everything in our power to attack the the holistic issue, every variable of the problem. And um, with your support, we can just continue to add scale and scope to what we're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we really need your help now more than ever. We lost our Facebook page, which had almost a million followers. We still haven't been able to get that page back. So we are really hurting from a fundraising standpoint right now and um, really need your love and support. So, and, and anyone can DM me. I'm real good on connections and communicating. So hit me up. And and by the way, even the smallest amount helps. So don't think just because you're not giving an extraordinary amount that it isn't helping. So not to do it, um, even the most little bit um, means a lot, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, all right, totally. Zach, thank you so much. Let's stay in touch and um, God bless you and good luck to you. Very much appreciate the, the time. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Me too. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.